in this table the details of all the pathways carrying the unconscious proprioception are summarized i can quickly go through and highlight those specialties ventral spinocerebellar tract originates from l1 to s5 segments parts from lower limb and the trunks only it's, it receives the proprioceptive inputs predominantly from golgi organs group 1b fibers they relay in dorsal root in gray dorsal root in gray matter 157 lamina and then cross to the opposite side ascend as ventral spinocerebellar tract and then reach the pons through the superior cerebellar peduncle there is one more crossing second time it crosses and reaches the cerebellum representing the lower extremity the fibers reaching the cerebellum as mossy fibers in case of posterior spinocerebellar tract c8 to l3 segments are involved all the proprioceptive inputs covered by these segments trunk and lower limb are the parts supplied predominantly muscle spindle group 1a fibers relayed in clark's column they do not cross and ascend ipsilaterally as posterior spinocerebellar tract reach the medulla through the inferior cerebellar peduncle reach the spinocerebellum as mossy fibers in case of rostral spinocerebellar tract the segments involved are c4 to c7 mainly upper limb and neck they receive proprioceptive inputs predominantly from golgi organs 1b fibers the nerve enters through the dorsal root ganglia and then in the dorsal horn lamina 157 of the spinal crane these fibers do not cross and they ascend ipsilaterally on the rostral side of the uh, posterior spinocerebellar tract that means they are placed rostrally they reach the medulla through the inferior peduncle they go to the spinocerebellum representing the neck and upper extremity region and in the cerebellum they are as mossy fibers the cuneo cerebellar tract they have from they originate from c2 to t7 neck and upper limb proprioceptors predominantly muscle spindle group 1a fibers they travel along with the fasciculus cuneatus in the posterior column and relay in the lateral cuneate nucleus in the medulla and the second order neurons from the lateral cuneate nucleus the axons they reach the ipsilateral cerebellum through inferior cerebellar peduncle these fibers in the spinal cerebellum as mossy fibers spino olivary tract this receives inputs from all segments of the spinal cord from the entire body proprioceptors they reach the dorsal dorsal gray matter through the dorsal root ganglia and relay there in lamina 3 4 on the marginal side here the second order neurons cross to the opposite side and ascend as inferior olivary nucleus inferior olivary tract and they 
relay in inferior olival olivary nucleus in the medulla the from the olivary nucleus the fresh tract originate that is olivo cerebellar tract and via the inferior cerebellar peduncle they will reach the spinocerebellum as climbing fibers now important uh, question is these uh, spinocerebellar fibers and uh, olivary fibers where they end in the cerebellum let us look into the cerebellum in a physiological perspectives <clears throat> it can be divided into three major parts the outer to outer part of the cerebellar hemisphere known as a lateral cerebellum this is connected with the cerebrum in terms of the motor planning and coordination that is cerebro cerebellum then central part as indicated by that star spino cerebellum that is vermis and para vermis area that is spinal spino cerebellum this receives spino cerebellum receives inputs from the axial muscles as well as um, distal muscles uh, which are uh, doing action third part of the cerebellum is connected with the vestibular system that is vestibulo cerebellum that forms the flocculo nodular lobe now the cerebellum each part of the cerebellum has a nucleus the deep cerebral what is called a deep cerebellar nuclei the cerebral part that is a lateral cerebellum is having dentate nucleus in case of the spino cerebellum there are two nuclei one nucleus interpositus and the vermis the central portion which is receiving the axial inputs that is called vestigial nucleus the flocculo nodular lobe that is that have a vestibular nucleus these are the nuclei on the other side where they will give if you are coming back vermis is connected with the axial muscles all the proprioceptive to inputs from them and then the output also reach to them the output of the vestigial nucleus will go to vestibular nucleus and reticular nucleus which try to govern the posture and gravity through these axial muscles whereas the distal muscles the where these are muscles for fine movements running walking talking and even writing all these distal muscles are performed by the distal muscles nucleus interpositus is involved the output from the nucleus interpositus goes to red nucleus collicular nucleus and reticular nucleus they modulate the distal muscles they try to dampen or prevent the overshoot or undershoot of the action and also they govern the eye movements direct pathways enter the cerebellum as mossy fibers and the olivary fibers that is the indirect pathway they enter the cerebellum as climbing fibers we will see this thing in the next slide these are this is this is showing the representation of the various proprioceptors 
in the cerebellum you can just see there is a double representation one the head side down in the anterior cerebellum you can just see that and again this is a part of the entry in the bottom also there is a part of the anterior cerebellum that is a, that's a curved one so now you have one side it is upside down the central one the axial muscles are represented in the vermis the limb muscles are represented in the little intermediate that is the spinocerebellum intermediate part of the spinocerebellum the, then the you can just see the extraocular muscles and uh, the head muscles are also there it is in a reverse direction that is how it is being topographically monitored on the other side there is a location in the center the vermis have the vermis have the both the, the both sides put together then comes the limbs one side the other side upper limb and lower limb and the neck muscles this is the uh, typical arrangement of the distribution of the proprioceptors in the cerebellum similarly the same type of motor activity is given by these uh, group of uh, fibers or two group of these uh, group of uh, nuclei thus the proprioceptors are represented on both sides you can just see on both sides there is a lot of connections and but the fibers they they reach up to ipsilaterally then they get mixed up uh, briefly now we discuss about the processing of the proprioceptive sensation in the cerebellum on the left hand side we have the cerebellar cellular architecture the purkinje cells represented as pc or the large neurons they are the main neurons of the cerebellum they give inhibitory output to the deep cerebellar nucleus that is nc the output from the deep cerebellar nucleus to the various other places is always excitatory thus purkinje cells modulate the output whether it is going in bursts or it is diminished the vestigial output to the output of the deep cerebellar nucleus is excitatory to the respective area the vestigial nucleus gives output to the vestibular nucleus and the reticular nucleus because this is concerned with the posture equilibrium and maintenance of gravity the interpositus nucleus gives output to the red nucleus primarily that is for the movement or the locomotion and also the collicular nucleus wherein the eye movement is monitored then reticular nucleus for coordinating we have other cellular type the one the g or granular cell that is another important cell in the cerebellar outline granular cells are give a t like projections and these axons they interdigitate or connect with the purkinje cell dendrites purkinje cells have a huge dendritic carburization like a tree these parallel fibers cut these uh, branches various branches of the tree and at each cutting they will make a synapse that is shown there with the one one synapse they are uh, they granular cell output is excitatory 
and this excitatory output to the Purkinje cell excites the Purkinje cell. The mossy fibers originating from the spinocerebellar tracts, the dorsal spinocerebellar, ventral spinocerebellar, rostral spinocerebellar, and uh, the cuneocerebellar tracts, they ascend as a mossy output. The mossy output comes here, excite the deep cerebellar nuclei, and also excite the granular cell. Once it excites the deep cerebral nucleus, there is a, a burst of activity going to the excitatory activity going to the uh, respective areas as mentioned, either with a vestigial or interpositus nucleus outputs. Then granular cell, ex the, the input to the granular cell, the excitatory input to the granular cell provide the excitatory input to the Purkinje cell and these Purkinje cells once they are excited they will restrict or they will send inhibitory uh, inputs to the deep granular so that means the action is began then it is modulated because there should not be too much of action that means action has to be modulated this is the modulation by the Purkinje cells we have the basket cells modulating the Purkinje cells. There are stellate cells which are not shown there and we have the Golgi cells GC which will modulate the granular cell output. On the other hand we have the climbing fibers. You see the climbing fibers there. They come and climb the Purkinje cells and they will excite the Purkinje cells so that uh, they will excite the deep nucleus and the Purkinje cells. First, the action begins, then climbing fibers abruptly stops. Overall, when action begins, we see that the first one to come is the mossy input because you have only one nuclear one synapse there, then second synapse is coming here that is relaying a spinocerebellar tract relaying into the, uh, the deep cerebellar nucleus and the granular cells. So they, it arrives first, it begins the action and once it begins the action, that action has to be stopped. Now the, at the same time, the gall, now the climbing fibers come because the climbing fibers have one more synapse there in the inferior olivary nucleus. From there, it traverses into the, into the inferior peduncle and to the cerebellum as climbing fibers and it will come and excite this thing. So that means it reinforces the action initiated by the mossy fiber. And then it will abruptly, or uh, it will stimulate the Purkinje cell very strongly, and it will. So the overall action of the mossy fiber and the climbing fiber is to smoothen the action. That thus it dampens or prevents the overshoot of the action. It makes it smooth. Little. It requires uh, when we take, take up the cerebellum, we will go a little more detail. This is how the cerebellar processing is taking place through the mossy fiber and the climbing fiber input, and both of them modulate the deep cerebellar nuclear output to the respective areas. What are the various clinical conditions associated with this sensation? I mention in the posterior column sensations, sub one condition is subacute combined degeneration, wherein there is a deficiency of the vitamin B12 and folic acid. Vitamin B12 is necessary for erythropoiesis as we already know in addition to that it is necessary for the synthesis of myelin in the deficiency of vitamin b12 the myelin synthesis is altered and hence the large diameter fibers are affected that is the subacute combined degeneration 
When large diameter fibers are affected, all the sensations carried by the posterior column are altered. So that means touch, pressure, vibration, they will be diminished or lost. Proprioception is also lost. Or any demyelinating disorders. may be viral toxin genetic just like uh, multiple sclerosis the tapes dorsalis is another condition the tertiary syphilis affects the the myelin synthesis and uh, that would uh, also affect the posterior column neurons so that means all these sensations are altered that means posterior column is affected other gen genetic disorders like a frederick's ataxia the one thing common with all these condition is they affect the large diameter fibers hence the posterior column sensations are altered while the uh, the pain and thermal sensations which are not uh, transmitted with the posterior column are preserved now we will try to look into the various tests performed to evaluate the functionality of the proprioception one of the test is romberg sign to evaluate romberg sign the person is asked to stand with closed eyes and feet held together normally healthy person is able to stand without any swaying on either side or falling the persons with a posterior column lesions they will sway on either side and even fall so when you are performing this test you have to be cautious to see that the person should not fall down and get injured the inability to balance is due to the absence of proprioceptive inputs from the lower limb to the cerebellum and this type of ataxia is known as a sensory ataxia and when such a response takes place this is called romberg sign positive also it is called rombergism on the other hand there is another term called motor ataxia it is due to the defect in the cerebellum in this condition person is not able to stand even with a closed open eyes so that means there is a defect in the cerebellum number 2 we have to evaluate various spinal reflexes because these spinal reflexes are carried by the afferents either originating from the intrafusal fibers or from the golgi tendon organs they are also known as a, there are also known as a flexor reflex afferents so all these reflexes the stretch reflex elicited by intrafusal fiber inverse stretch reflex by the tendon golgi tendon organs or a cross extensor reflex or reciprocal inhibition so on are lost or diminished in posterior column lesions another important test to evaluate the function is to observe the gait person is asked to walk in a straight line 
while he is walking we observe the persons with posterior column lesions they they walk very clumsily they look down and place the foot on the ground with a great force practically they pound or they stamp that is why it is known as a stamping gait sometimes these persons lose balance and fall frequently in no circumstances uh, he the person with the posterior column le lesions will not be able to walk in a straight line with a closed eye because he will sway on either side and even he fall down this is all because the absence of position sense which is carried from the lower limb is missing i have referred following books as the base however most of the information has been researched and taken from number of sites which i have mentioned then and there uh, it is just in order to give a, a comprehensive view of the proprioceptive sensation hope oh, it will be fine in my next lecture i will continue with the interlateral column sensations pathway processing thank you here i have given some assignments for your own assessment uh just uh, go through them and uh, complete them and try to evaluate yourself and these are some of the assignments uh, which you can uh, keep uh, working uh, maybe they will be little longer questions you can just uh, look at that and uh, try to study them backwards thank you very much